Hi, I'm Julie Harper from Birmingham, Alabama, and we're just going to take a real practical run through sunscreens. And we're going to talk about a lot of things that I just end up talking about with my patients really every single day. I have no relevant conflict of interest for this topic, except that I see people who look like this just about every day. And so I would look at this person in my nicest way. I would say, well, I think you need to do a little better about sunscreen. But what does this person say to me? They say, but I do wear sunscreen. And you love it when they say it just, it, you know, I just naturally get so brown, it doesn't work well for me. Well, I think there's probably some alternative hypotheses as to why we're seeing that much sun on people. And one of them is that they're probably just not wearing enough sunscreen. Um, we know that when SPF is tested, it is tested at a certain thickness, two milligrams per centimeter squared. And so if you are not putting sunscreen on thick enough, you are not going to get the measured SPF or the labeled SPF that's on that product. We have multiple studies, and we're gonna talk about one of them here in a minute, but multiple studies that show that people use 20 to 50% of the recommended amount of SPF or sunscreen. And so again, they're not getting what's labeled on the bottle. Some of the most interesting studies that were done with this were done at a nudist beach. And that is because you know, you've got to always keep in mind how big is the swimsuit? You know, there are going to be parts of the body maybe where they're not putting sunscreen, but hopefully not at the nudist beach. So somebody went to the nudist beach, gave people bottles of sunscreen, told them to apply it. They did not watch that part. And then they gave the sunscreen bottles back and then they weighed them. And they found that, yes, in fact, people used about 20% of the amount of sunscreen that they should have used. So that could be one reason for pot potential sunscreen failure. It may be that people just aren't putting on enough. It should take about one ounce of sunscreen to cover the body for one application. And we know that most people use less than one bottle of sunscreen per year. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you in the audience brought more than one bottle with you for this particular trip. Sun protection, we also know, go ahead and just start with a high SPF. And that is based a little bit on what we just said. If you're not putting it on thick enough, then instead of starting with a 30 and ending up at a 10, let's go ahead and start at a 70 and end up in a safer zone. But we also, of course, want people to look for the language broad spectrum and water resistant. We know the bottle will either say water resistant 40 minutes or water resistant 80 minutes. If it doesn't say one of those, it's not water resistant at all. It's not sweat resistant. So just keep that in mind. You also, another way to teach patients how to use this is that shot glass amount, or you can be more specific and say one teaspoon for the face, head, and neck, one teaspoon for each of the upper extremities, two teaspoons on the torso and two teaspoons to each of the lower extremities. And then reapply every 90 minutes to two hours and maybe even more if you're gonna be in the water. These things are just crucial. And I know I, you guys know all of this, but remind your patients, if you don't tell them this, some, sometimes the things that to us have just become kind of almost tired and so intuitive still aren't to our patients. So seek shade. Wear protective clothing. How many times have I told my tennis players, could you look for a shirt maybe that has a higher crew neck because we just get so much sun damage across the chest. Look for something that's got some kind of sleeve instead of just wearing a little tank. Wear a wide brimmed hat. The visor sure is cute, but it leaves a lot to be uh, exposed to the sun in the ears and on the sides of the neck and wear sunglasses. Okay, so some other pushback we get though is, but I've always heard that if you, you know, there's really not a big difference for, between an SPF 50 and an SPF 100, they're just more chemically, so I'm not gonna do that. Well, there was an interesting study published in the JAD in 2018. This was 199 people. It was a single center randomized split faced double blinded study on a, I like this part, on a sunny day during normal recreational skiing and snowboarding in Vail, Colorado, a fun study to be a part of. And so people were given unlabeled bottles of sunscreen. Now they had, I think, just some regular uh, directions on them, but one was a 100, one was a 50, and they didn't know which one, but they were going to do one on one side of their face and one on the other. And by the way, this was double blinded. There were going to be sometimes when the SPF 100 was on the right, but in other individuals, the SPF 100 would be on the left, and that would be to try to take into account time of day and sun exposure. And you can see the two sunscreens listed there, pretty similar. Um, in the end, we learned a lot here. Again, the average sun exposure duration was 6.1 hours, give or take a little bit. And in all of that 6.1 hours, the average number of free applications was 
1.1. So not just great. And then participants applied both test products at about half of the thickness that they were supposed to. So about 50% of what would be recommended if they were using it correctly. So did we see a difference between the SPF 100 and the SPF 50? And the answer is absolutely yes. And it was a statistically significant difference. 55.3% had more sunburn on the SPF 50 side. There was no difference in about 40% and then 5% there was more sunburn on the SPF 100 side. So definitely a difference here. And then when you look just at change in erythema score, definitely statistically significant more erythema on the side of the face that had SPF 50 versus the side of the face that was SPF 100. So there is a difference. Okay, so this is my same patient um, I pray that I can really love these people. And then he says, but I've heard sunscreen may cause cancer. Okay, well, I'm ready for this discussion too. So probably what you're talking about is oxybenzone or benzophenone 3. And it is a sunscreen product that uh, has been shown to affect uh, the coral, for example, and it's been called an endocrine disruptor. Now that's not really been shown to be the case so much in humans but it has been in some animal studies. It covers UVA and UV, UVB. It's also everywhere. This is photostabilizing. It's found in things like nail polish, fragrance, hairspray, cosmetics. It's used in food packaging. So it's pretty ubiquitous. It is a pretty common contact allergen. So that's one to watch out. When people say that they're allergic to sunscreen, it really could be oxybenzone. Now, sometimes it's something else in the product, but it could be oxybenzone. It can cause both allergic contact and photoallergic contact dermatitis. In fact, it's the most common photoallergen among all of the UV filters but then potentially this endocrine disruptor. Um, so we know it's been shown to have estrogenic effects both in vitro and in vivo animal models, but its estrogenic potency is like one million fold less than the estradiol control. And look at the second bullet here. So there were some animal studies done, and I believe in these studies, they were actually fed the oxybenzone and they were fed a lot, but they were fed this oxybenzone and then the rats were euthanized their uterus was then measured and they found that those who had been exposed to this oxybenzone had an increase in weight in the uterus. But if you put that into real life, it would take 277 years of daily application all over of sunscreen with 6% oxybenzone to achieve the levels that those rats were given. Um, also just keep in mind, this has been um, available in the United States since the 1970s. There are other FDA approved chemical UV filters that might be potential endocrine disruptors as well. So yes, oxybenzone, but also octanoxate and maybe homosalate. Always, and this is a recurring theme that all of us know so well, but it's good to remind our patients, the two that are always gonna come out just squeaky clean, including here, are gonna be the physical blockers like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. These are not endocrine, endocrine disruptors. And so when in doubt, or when we have those super cautious patients, just you know, head them in that direction and we're gonna win every time. Um, oxybenzone and its metabolites have been detected in fish with anti-androgenic and anti-estrogenic effects. We know they're genotoxic effects on coral. And again, this is pretty ubiquitous, many of the UV filters are. So um, UV filters, oxybenzone being number one, have been found in almost all water sources around the world. And they are not easily removed from wastewater treatment plant techniques with, the, with those techniques, so we don't clear them out of our water. And so when you look at the third bullet there, it says concentrations of UV filters in water sources have a seasonal variation. They can increase by, by about 25% in the summer. And so yes, that might be in our swimming pools and in the oceans around the reefs, but that's also when we take a shower and we're rinsing these off of our bodies and they get into the wastewater and then they're not easily removed. We also know that about 90% of the exposure is seen in about 10% of our reefs. And so uh, tourism definitely sees this uptick, but we also know UV filters have been identified in the Arctic as well. But all of that has led areas, in particular Hawaii, they, they passed a ban in May of 2018. This is now fully in effect. 
that really banned the sale and distribution of sunscreens, oxybenzone and octanoxate. So those are just no longer available. And the National Park Service has put out some information about this as well. Okay, so my, my very lovable patient who I know just really wants me to teach him and I'm ready says, but I read an article online and it said that the FDA admits that most sunscreens are probably unsafe. And this has been fact-checked. Well, that's not exactly what happened. Um, so what has happened is we did have an old final rule that listed these 16 different fil um, uh, filters, UV filters, as generally recognized and as safe and effective. But over time, with some of these concerns, they have now put a little pause button on that and said, we need more information on some of these. So there are now two products right now that are listed as generally recognized as safe and effective. And guess what? which ones those are? That is zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. There are two that are no longer listed as that. Okay, so that would be PABA and trolamine salicylate. But the rest of them now are listed in this category, insufficient data for use in sunscreen. So they're out there, but we're gathering more information. It does not say that they're unsafe. It says we need more information. But again, for your patients who want to be most cautious, just push them back over to zinc and titanium dioxide. Okay, this guy is really pushing my buttons because he has another question now. But what about the dangers of those nan nanoparticles? Okay, so maybe we've convinced them to use zinc or titanium, but if we don't put them on in a small particle size, they're gonna be beautifully white on the skin, okay? Just reflecting all kinds of light. So we get them down to these small particle sizes or nanoparticles, but now, now aren't they a problem? Well, first of all, do they penetrate the skin? The answer is no. They appear to be confined to the stratum corneum. And then number two, do they generate free radicals upon UV exposure? And the answer there is yes, they can, but we do think the endogenous antioxidant system is able to neutralize those reactive oxygen species. Okay, he's quickly becoming a very special patient. He now says, but, but don't I need my vitamin D? And I hear this one, I don't know about you guys, but almost every day. And this is my response to that. I think that's kind of funny, but I hope you thought that was funny. So vitamin D, uh, cutaneous vitamin D synthesis is mediated by ultraviolet B, not A. So most of the time in the tanning bed, that wouldn't do this. And UVB is going to fluctuate during the day and during the seasons, UVA stays pretty much the same. So there might be times or locations where this just wouldn't work very well at all. We know cutaneous synthesis of vitamin D3 is going to be impacted by things like latitude, season, environmental factors, cloud cover, pollution, skin pigmentation, and maybe sunscreen, although it doesn't seem like we're terribly good at that part. So even people using sunscreen, that usually does not um, add up to mean a vitamin D deficiency. There are three sources of vitamin D. We have vitamin D rich foods, we have dietary supplementation, and we have cutaneous synthesis in the presence of ultraviolet B. And one of these is a known carcinogen. And so which one are we gonna recommend? Probably not the one that's a known carcinogen. I can't remember who I heard say it. This was not my novel idea, but she said, you know, it would be like if there was one little part of a cigarette that was really healthy, we wouldn't all of a sudden tell people to start smoking because we already know that they're a risk. And it's the same thing here. What are the current daily recommendations? 600 international units between the ages of one to 70 and 800 international units over the age of 70. And I don't, I'm not recommending this by the way, but one tablespoon of cod liver oil has 1,360 international units of vitamin D. And I am proud to say that I have never tried that and I don't plan to. Okay, sun protective clothing. This is just one of my favorite fixes for this. We should all be doing more of this. I don't even know how many rash guard shirts I have. I have probably 10. Um, I love them. Uh, my family has gotten to where they love them. My teenagers might love them a tiny bit less now than they did when they were 12, uh, but we overall still do really well with these. Um, and that's those are specific UPF fabrics made for swimming even, but just your simple clothing can be sun protective. There's some things that would make it more effective at, at that. For example, dark colors are gonna have more protection than light colors. 
tightly woven fabrics are going to do better than like a loose linen. Synthetic and semi-synthetic fabrics like polyester and rayon, again, are going to do better than something like linen. But you can also look for UPF labeled fabrics. Now that UPF um, indicates the fraction of the sun's ultraviolet rays that penetrate the fabric. So for example, if you've got something and the label says UPF 50, it indicates that 1 50th of the sun's UV rays are reaching the skin. So UPF 50, 1 50th. Uh, now without you know, special measuring or treatment, you could guess that a white t-shirt has a UPF of about seven. And when it's wet, probably closer to a UPF of three. But if you were ever brave enough to wear a long sleeve dark denim shirt outside, there you could have a UPF of 1,700, which would equal complete sunblock. Okay, so this is all just too much for my patient. And he says, isn't there just a pill that I can swallow? Really, this is just sounds like too much work. And of course, there are some pills. They are not going to replace all of those other things that we just talked about. All, everything else goes together hand in hand. But we can do a couple of things. We could add this antioxidant, polypodium leucotomus. And I don't think we can go so far as to say this prevents skin cancer. Although when you look at all of the things it does, it stands to reason that it might. But it does seem to protect against sunburn, which is certainly important. And this is used not just in people who might be at risk for skin cancer, but people, even people with melasma or people with um, photosensitive, any type of dermatosis that's photosensitive. But this is an antioxidant. It can counteract UV-induced immunosuppression. It can reduce sunburn cells, activate tumor suppressor P53 gene, inhibits COX-2, reduces cyclobutane dimer. So a lot of things that sound like they would be pro-cancer, it's having an inhibitory effect on. So that is certainly something our patients can benefit from. We also have nicotinamide, which is a vitamin B3. And nicotinamide, we know, can prevent ATP depletion and enhance DNA repair. It also reduces the level of immunosuppression induced by UV radiation. And it has been studied in a, a very well done trial looking at skin cancer prevention. This was called the on track trial. So it was oral nicotinamide to reduce actinic cancer. This was a multi center, double blind, randomized, placebo controlled phase three trial. 386 patients, they were randomized one to one to receive either nicotinamide 500 milligrams twice a day or placebo for 12 months. And then there was also a six month follow up where they weren't on anything, but they continued to be assessed. And these were all people who were high risk, like these guys were makers of skin cancers, makers of AK. So skin cancer checks were performed by dermatologists at baseline and at three month intervals, not just for the 12 months, but for 18 months. So even out until they'd been off of the nicotinamide for six months. And I tried to kind of flag this. I think I might've covered up some of the important stuff, but I'm sure you've seen this before, but just to remind you, there was a 23% overall reduction in non-melanoma skin cancer in those on nicotinamide, again, 500 milligrams BID, 20% decrease in basal cell, 30% decrease in squamous cell over that 12 month period. Now, one unfortunate thing was in the six month follow-up period, that didn't stick around. So it really only seemed to work while people were on it. It didn't seem to have any legs after it was stopped, but it still gives us something to do in those patients who really make skin cancers at a frequent pace. The last bullet on this I think is interesting. So interestingly, the rate of sunscreen use in the week before baseline and at the three month visits, so they were being asked about sunscreen use, it was actually lower in the nicotinamide group than it was in the placebo group. So that doesn't appear that that was a confounder. Nicotinamide truly seemed to have an impact here, reducing the development of, of non-melanoma skin cancer. Also, and I don't know a ton about this, but I wanna include it. So DNA repair enzymes, this is when a bacterial, this is not oral, by the way, I'm back to topical. This is when a bacterial or plant DNA repair enzyme, like an endonuclease or photoreactivating enzymes are borrowed from bacteria or plants and then are functioning inside human cells. This can speed the removal of DNA damage caused by sunlight, decrease cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers again. And the first patent for these was in 1991. And you would see these under the names of like photosomes or photolyase, uh, UV endonuclease or ultrasomes, and there's others listed here as well. 
So in summary, um, I think as we talk to our patients about sunscreen, and it's so important that we do keep in mind that they don't know near as much about this as we do, even if they think they do. So I hope this gives you a little information on the right sunscreen the right way, an update on oxybenzone, nanoparticles, vitamin D, polypodium leukotomus, niacinamide, and DNA repair enzymes. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoy the meeting.